I want machines, rather like computers, to be an extension of the arm of the composer. With the multi-track tape recorder, one builds up track against track, in a way that's going on, of course, in the pop world and the serious music world and all over the place. Sound is transmitted through the air as vibrations, which are detected by the eardrum and interpreted by the brain. The pitch of a sound is determined by the frequency, the number of vibrations per second, and the loudness by the size of the vibrations. The actual quality of a sound, what makes a violin sound different from a flute, for instance, is a more complicated matter. We can represent sound graphically. If we draw a line to represent time, and another line to represent intensity or loudness, we can draw a third line to illustrate one actual vibration. The line starts at naught seconds and no intensity, builds up to a maximum intensity at one on the timeline, and returns to zero intensity at two on the timeline. If we measure the time in milliseconds, or in other words, thousandths of a second, then we can say that the vibration has risen and fallen in two milliseconds. But just as a vibrating spring moves out in one direction and then back through its central position to the opposite direction, so we can continue the graph line downwards to a maximum intensity in the other direction after three milliseconds and back to zero again after four milliseconds. This curve now represents one complete cycle and because it all happened in four milliseconds, this means that the complete cycle can occur 250 times in one second or to put it more technically, that the sound has a frequency of 250 cycles per second, which is close to middle C. A device called an oscilloscope can give a graphic illustration of a note immediately it is played. If we double the frequency from 250 cycles per second to 500 cycles per second, we raise the pitch by one octave. But this particular sound is very simple and rather dull as one might expect from its very smooth, rounded curve. It only has one constant frequency and is known as a sine tone, the wave form itself being called a sine wave. A violin, for example, produces a much more jagged wave shape, while a flute produces a different shape again. To see how these wave shapes are made, we can, as it were, take a note apart into its components and discover that a clarinet, for example, playing middle C, actually produces several different notes at once. Not only the fundamental note C, but also a note three times that frequency, five times, seven times, and so on. However, these other notes, or harmonics as they're called, generally appear at lesser intensity than the fundamental note, and when combined, we hear the, the fundamental note colored by the harmonics. In this way, you can produce synthetically a sound similar to that of a clarinet. It isn't exactly the same, however, for two main reasons. First, that the way an instrument sounds depends very largely on the start of the note, the sounds generated at the beginning of the vibrations. If you fade up a note on a flute and a clarinet while they are sounding, they seem much less different from each other than if you catch the initial tack of a note. The second main reason for the difference between the real and synthetic clarinet sound is that the synthetic sound, once generated, continues with exactly the same pitch, harmonic content and intensity unless you take deliberate steps to alter them. In the case of an actual clarinet, there are slight variations in all these factors which introduce an element of imperfection and unpredictability. And these imperfections have contributed to our idea of what makes a sound musical. Although simulating existing sounds has its own fascination, what has interested composers has been the creation of entirely new sounds using electronic devices. Sounds can be generated electronically. Sounds which are more complex than the simple sine wave and which can't be produced by any other means. The square wave is one example of this. Another is the so-called sawtooth wave. 
White noise is a sound which contains all audible frequencies, but it is usually filtered to produce sounds with some suggestion of pitch. These sounds can be treated or combined to produce new sound elements, or, alternatively, acoustically produced sounds can be recorded and modified. This sound occurs naturally at one pitch. Playing the recording at different speeds will change the pitch. It will also change the length and the character of the sound. By a process of cutting the tape and removing parts or joining them up in different places, different sound and rhythm effects can be produced. Somewhere around 1956, I was starting to build some sort of equipment, uh, rather sealing wax and string equipment. And then I, in 1957, was asked to do some incidental music for a television play. And I did this in Broadcasting House by getting together in the middle of the night all the tape recorders that I could find in studios, collecting them together in one studio, and working until they had to be put back next morning, sleeping a little bit, and then coming back in to do my normal chamber music work. Uh, so then it grew from that. I was asked then to help to start the radiophonic workshop. Largely, the aim of providing material for third program drama, which had uh, was starting to explore plays of the mind and psychological drama, and we, we felt a need for something other than uh, normal orchestral incidental music. We work entirely here on BBC projects, so that all the music, all the sound that we have to produce is applied. The idea of sitting down and writing a piece of music ten minutes long without some sort of stimulus um, fills me with horror. I think it's a very limited um, type of uh, music. A certain type of productions you can work better than um, an ordinary music, uh, music group could perform. Um, science fiction is an obvious thing, and um, unbalanced minds and this sort of thing, you know, nightmare sequences, it works very well. But we often call in musicians to help us because we feel that electronic music is not enough. But the piece I'm working on now is a, a radio spoof. Um, it's of three medieval instruments that don't in fact exist. The shagbut, which is a two-man trombone, uh, which is made mainly of boiled leather and 25 feet of copper tubing. The minikin, which is a sort of arthritic virginals, uh, about six yards long, with a mechanism that takes exactly a minute from keyboard to string. And the Flemish clacket, which is a sort of lute, um, except that it's 15 foot high and it hasn't got a fingerboard, and you play it from the inside. That is, the player's inside and the tuner is outside. In fact, the, um, the, the sound sources used were very simple. My mouth, which gave us the shagbut basic sounds, the, and a, an auto harp, which we recorded the plucking of strings in various ways. But this is a note just coming out of one side. You'll hear it very slowly start to go round, building up all the time. And it finally comes out in a rather low, indistinct sound, really. Not, it's not a particularly uh, splendid instrument. In fact, that's probably why it's extinct. Um, the minikin uh, has this strange ratcheting, gratcheting mechanism, which uh, takes us through to the striking of the string. Uh, probably the best thing is to play a bit of the mechanism which leads up to the final magnificent performance of the work, um, which goes reasonably well, if not a little sporadic, until the canonic, canonic part of the uh, piece, where it gets far too much for all the players and the whole lot collapses in a terrible heap. Um, you hear the minikin start it spluttering and coughing, and then the other two instruments come in. First the shagbut and the minikin, which is a little plingy noise, and then the clacket comes in splendidly on the bass line. There we are. Clacket, gratchet, gratchet it goes. For a while. And then the tune. Splendid piece of play. It's very, um, very novel. Written by Huckball, the one-legged of Brobhausen.
telephonic workshop was concentrating somewhat on the drama side, and I wanted to concentrate on the music side. So I set up my own studio here uh, just around 10 years ago. I thought if one could break down the whole process into the separate parameters, if one could control volume separately from vibrato, pitch separately again, and then define each of these in a drawing, which one could go back and rub out, if one didn't want what one had done. Uh, this would both simplify the thing, it would make it much quicker, and I think uh, open up completely new sounds. I begin with a drawn pattern. This is freehand drawn at the moment, quite an empirical process to find out what pattern makes what sort of sound. So having drawn this on a slide, I then present that slide to the equipment. Then I define the pitch by putting digital information onto what I call the program. I then can also change the pitch in analog fashion by drawing in on a 35 millimeter film a waving line which goes up or down the film for pitch change and can waver very slightly for giving vibrato. Now this I think is a very important part of musical sound. If one does it by purely electronic means, one tends to get fixed on one vibration one frequency of vibrato, uh, which becomes dull. When you do it by hand, you can start the note with a vibrato that's fast and finish it with a slow one or vice versa and change it however you like within the note. I would like to have a tape recorder with a great number of tracks. I'm building one here on 35 millimeter film uh, so that there's not much mixing process going on of dubbing across from one to the other and one should be able to eventually get a, a equipment with perhaps 32 tracks. I think that music should be a projection of a thought process in the mind of a human being. And in this way, I get a bit lost when computers come along and taking random number tables uh, then can give us music by the yard.